And today we're talking about uncovering hidden connections in your supply chain. And, you know, this is a really interesting topic because a lot of people think about, you know, what is it that I buy? Where am I getting uh, my goods to conduct my business? And what, you know, we're, we're going to see is that a lot of times we kind of know the beginning and the end, but what's in the middle, who's connected in the middle, who's playing a role in getting me my finished good. We may not have visibility into that. And so we may have risks that are hidden in our supply chain that we're unaware of. So, uh, you know, to me today, we've got Sam Fayez. He's a data scientist and supply chain consultant uh, for Dun & Bradstreet. And Matt Fellows, he's a data scientist here at Dun & Bradstreet. So welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Hi, Brian. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. I know we're going to we have a lot of uh, interesting insights to share with everybody today. Uh, so again, we're going to be talking about shipping data and ways that people can use this data to look deeper into their supply chain. Uh, you know, as I said, most people are aware that, hey, if I order uh, a product from Amazon or whatever, that, hey, I'm just going to get it delivered to me. That, that's at the consumer level. If I'm looking at the business level and I say, hey, I want to buy uh, chips from uh, a company uh, like NVIDIA or whatever, there's a lot more to just having that chip get delivered from NVIDIA or whatever the product that I need. Um, you know, last week we talked about shock absorbers for the cars and how there were some disruptions that, that caused that ripple into the supply chain. But as we look at those, um, what we want to do is really discuss the ways that individuals can actually look into the supply chain to find these hidden risks. And we want to talk about that. So whether it's disruption, whether it's a day-to-day, -day, having an understand, have an understanding of what's in your supply chain, who's in your supply chain, where risks might lie is going to be really critical. Um, you know, last week we talked about the shipping data and that there's $14 trillion a year that travel via maritime. Uh, today we're going to expand that a little bit. We're going to talk about the trucks, the trains as well, and, and all those different nodes. And, you know, with that, Sam, as we prepped about it, you talked about that really what's, what is a supply chain? And you talked about it being a network of nodes. So let me start with you and talk a little more about that and tell me, you know, let's talk about what that means and why that's so important as we look in, in to find these risks. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I mean, very, very interesting and very, uh, you know, hot and uh, topic. So, so when we look at the supply chain, you know, to, to really conceptually define it so that we can really understand and improve and identify the weakness you know let's look first at the supply chain as a network right so it's basically nodes which can be you know companies manufacturing firms suppliers um, you know even even logistics uh, providers and then you have links that connects these nodes but basically when we look at this network there are you know certain flows that go through this network that the most important one uh, which is which is the physical one is the material flow, which is the flow of goods, you know, between these nodes. And then you have on top of that, you have the information flow that actually, you know, dictates how and when this material will flow. And then at the end, you have also the financial flow that goes against, you know, these uh, different flow of materials. So in in DMB in Dun and Brad Street, you know. It's a unique position because you know having information about 400 million companies worldwide, and not only public companies but public and private companies, that give us actually a, a very high visibility for these nodes. Now, adding to that the shipping data, which are the links. Now, think about the power of combining these data together, so that you can have a full picture of how this material flow flows between these different nodes all the way to the destination. So now focusing on, on this shipping data. So, so the shipping data uh, that, that we have, um, it's, it's, it's several things, but I, I will start to you know, piece them little by little. Um, it's at the bill of lading level. So you know, the bill of lading has a lot of information information about the product, information about, you know, all the parties involved in, in moving in moving them. Uh, but also it has, you know, value and weight and, and, and things that we can, you know, extract information from this to give us even, you know, a more clear picture. So, so the shipping data scope is actually global uh, ocean shipping. Uh, we have also trucking in, in, in certain countries, very high concentration in the United States. But for the ocean shipping, um, you know, we have 
macro data that focusing on you know the origin country ports uh, ports are coded with the um, you know the united nations local to can actually pinpoint uh, where these uh, ports are and then on top of that we have the actual hs code which which we were able to use this hs code to build a product map on top of the shipping data uh, then you know the shipping data itself we have booking data which is like you know the intention to move certain freight from a certain origin to a certain destination but also we have the shipping instruction when this booking uh, are actually uh, confirmed and the, the material is in initialized so so looking at you know looking at the scope of this you know having you know tracking and tracing the the, the, the containers itself or the packages you know, all the way from the origin to the destination. On top of that, then all the different notified parties that we can actually infer from that, the supply chain nodes, along with the Dun & Bradstreet data. And then the product, which on top of that, you know, give us the material flow uh, at the micro and also at the macro level. So it's really interesting being able to have that visibility and being able to track everything that way. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is we look at this, you know, Matt, um, we talked a lot about that, of, of that, you know, kind of question, uh, you know, that the linkages and the nodes and everything, you know, when we look at it and you're looking at the different types of information we might have, let's talk about kind of financial viability. What's the UBO piece of it? Countries of origin, those, those risk factors that we're able to look at as we, as we connect those dots of here's the shipping information, here's the nodes, the linkages, and that DNB data. What are some of those insights we're looking for as we look at this data to uncover those connections? Sure. So as Sam was saying, this, um, this shipping data that we have, we can gain some key insights, especially when we combine it with our own Dun & Bradstreet data, we can uncover and gain a more holistic view of a supply chain network for an industry or a specific company. And when we have that more specific view, we can use some of Dun & Bradstreet's um, risk scores that have to do with rating financial health or our UBO data, as you mentioned, to figure out who really is the beneficial owner of the company. Um, you know, maybe it's somebody, the company is located in the United States, but the beneficial owner is actually located in England. Um, so with all this data and the, this holistic view of the supply chain, we can really get a sense of, are there single points of failure in the supply chain network? Are there companies that are at greater financial risk um, that could pose a risk to the overall supply chain's health? Um, and we can also see are there companies within the supply chain that are um, owned by foreign entities that we would not really know if we're, um, you know, at the top of the supply chain and there's a company down in, let's say, tier two or tier three that we just have no visibility to without all of this data? Okay, so that's good. So Matt, you know, one of the things that we wanted to talk about is Hurricane Ida just hit. It's, it was a, you know, big event. And you know, last week we did talk about disruptions and everything. Can you walk us through an example of something where, I don't know, you pick the industry, you pick whatever it is, but how how would this kind of how would we use this information? Let's let's walk through. You know, Ida hits. Maybe it's the oil thing. You know, that oil was slow to come up through the port. Um, I know we talked before this about I'm I'm a toy I'm, I sell toys for the holiday season. You know, we, we, talk to me about how I might use that data and, and understand what I might be running into and, and how I'm drawing the connections. Sure. So, yes, as you said, Hurricane Ida hit and it caused a huge disruption at ports in the New Orleans area and um, shut them down for a couple of days. Um, and and we know from our shipping insight data that these New Orleans ports, one of their largest imports, is oil, as you mentioned. Um, also, interestingly enough, in, immunological products, so products that have to do with vaccines, is also a big import into the ports in the New Orleans area. Um, but getting back to oil, um, oil is a key input into plastics, and there's some pretty large plastic manufacturers in the Louisiana area. 
So this disruption at a New Orleans port could cause um, a disruption at these uh, plastic manufacturers because they might not be getting the oil that they need to create the plastics. And then this could then cause a, another disruption downstream. Let's say a toy manufacturer uses the plastic to create a toy. And this toy manufacturer could be located, let's say, in Tennessee. And then this toy manufacturer isn't able to make as many toys for the Christmas season, and there could be a shortage of a certain toy. So we can see that just one event, like a hurricane, could cause a huge disruption at a port, which then causes um, a disruption at this plastic manufacturer, which then causes a disruption at a toy manufacturer. And then come Christmas time, some people might have trouble getting a certain kind of toy. So these these disruptions really do have long-term effects and this, these shipping insight data can help us foresee these, these issues that might, might arise. So, so it's safe to say that if I'm, you know, I'm, uh, you know, as a government agency, I want to pay attention to that as well, because if, if that toy manufacturer or that toy sales company is located in my state, my County, my city, whatever I'm, uh, you know, is my, my remit that, it seems that that's a big concern of mine because understanding, okay, this happened, but will that impact my industries? And I guess in a lot of cases, there's probably some kind of uh, you know, hidden surprises, if you will, that, oh, I don't really think that's going to impact me. I'm all the way out in, you know, I don't know, pick, pick, pick a state, Oregon, what, you know, California, whatever it is. Well, but in fact, it probably can have that ripple effect if you don't look at that supply chain. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I definitely think so. I think this is um, something that's very important for governments to keep an eye on, local governments, the federal government, um, because looking at it from above as the consumer or even as a government, we might only be seeing this that, oh, look, the toy manufacturer is making toys, um, but we can't see where they're getting their inputs from and definitely not where the... Um, let's say the plastic is one of the inputs, we, we definitely can't see where the inputs for the plastic manufacturers are coming from. So this is, this is all, I would say, very important information um, when considering the uh, overall health of the economy, as you're saying as well. Okay. Yeah, and also like uh, I want to add, like th this is a very good point, and and one of one of the key elements in the supply chain uh, as a network is the interdependencies, and, and these interdependencies, um, you know, I mean you can you can think about it in a, in a logical way, but but down at the data level, you know, having all this vast amount of information, we can actually not only conceptualize the interdependencies, but we can actually identify it accurately but also identify how these interdependencies, like Matt was saying, the ripple effect on the entire network of a supply chain. And, and this network of a supply chain, you know, yes, it has a material flow, but it has a material flow of finished goods as well as the raw material. So we can actually link it back, not only to one supply chain for one company, but, you know, at a higher level for, you know, an industry or even going back to down to a country to identify how everything is interrelated and will be impacted and ripple effect uh, at, at any point of time. And also, you know, as, as a prediction into the future, because, you know, everything happens on, on a timeline, right? I ship something, you know, like, or, or I have a, a purchase order, like now I will receive actually this purchase order maybe three months down the road. So, so having this time dimension as well uh, with the interdependencies, you know, will provide actually, you know, like a holistic, accurate view of all these interdependencies and impact on the economy. Okay, no, that's good, Sam. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, Sam, my next question for you actually is, you know, we talked again uh, as we got ready for this, you talked about this concept of a cash to cash cycle time. And wanted you to talk a little bit more about that and understand and talk to us about what's the direct impact uh, on a company's sales and revenue. And, you know, as you, before you go to that, you know, I think the impact here is as we think about government, when you're looking at I'm a workforce uh, or economic development 
professional, those are things I really care about. I want to make sure that the health of my businesses and my community is safe and that people have a good spot to work and that we're growing our tax base. So talk to me about the cash to cash cycle and, and how that might be used as one of those individuals to help them understand maybe where they have some weaknesses and strengths that they want to either mitigate some risks or continue to invest further. Yeah, it's very good. And, and before I go to cash to cash, I, I just want to highlight on when we, you know, having this data is, is, is one step, but also, you know, adding the supply chain expertise on top of that, and also the data science and analytical methodology on top of that is very important. So, so focusing on the supply chain, you know, there are, you know, specific KPIs or performance measures that you know any supply chain team in, in any organization or, or, or even at the government level will look at. And, and these supply chain metrics really focuses on you know, customer, fo fo you know, customer uh, facing, uh, like, you know, like delivery reliability, uh, you know, the, the responsiveness, uh, the, the, the resilience and the adaptability of, of the supply chain to respond to customer demand. But also there are internal factors that impact the company like you know what is the supply chain management cost right and and what is the asset efficiency one of them is the cash to cash cycle time but the cash to cash cycle time is is one of the important metrics because it's it's a kind of a hybrid metric it looks at you know the the, the performance of the supply chain and its impact on the financial performance so basically the cash to cash cycle time is a combination of accounts payable, which is actually like the, the, the amount of, of time that you need to pay to your suppliers. And you have the inventory days of supply. And, and this inventory days of supply is, is the amount of time that whatever inventory you got through your supply chain stays in your inventory. And then after you sell this inventory, there is a payment terms, which is the account sales outstanding. So looking at these three, you have the cash to cash cycle time. And you know, like the higher the cash to cash cycle time means that I will need more cash in order to invest, to be able to carry this inventory till I sell it and I get my fund. So, so focusing on the cash to cash cycle time, now going back to the shipping data, any delay in receiving this inventory will actually push my inventory days of supply to the right. So that means that it will definitely increase my cash to cash cycle time. And that will actually impact the financial health of the supply chain that is managing or you know, selling this product. And again, having the cash to cash cycle time is just one piece of the pie, but it can provide you know, on, a, on a macro view how the financial health of any one involved in a supply chain, you know, disruption impact will have on the financial health, which will definitely impact, you know, the, the economic development efforts uh, within a certain region from, you know, a public point of view. Oh, that's really good. Matt, anything to add to that? Um, sure. Yeah. So I think um, one important thing to consider um, as well is the when a disruption happens um, and a company um, is is affected by a disruption, let's say going back to the Hurricane Ida example, um, let's say we had this um, a plastic manufacturer, um, Dun Bradstreet is able to see um, kind of get a, a good sense of the overall financial health of of a company, and if this plastic manufacturer, um, if, they're, if they were not financially healthy and they're on the verge of, let's say, collapse, a disruption uh, like Hurricane Ida causing a disruption at the port and causing a disruption now at the plastic manufacturer, that could be the, you know, let's say the straw that breaks the camel's back. And that's, that's the, the, the disruption that now causes this plastic manufacturer to go out of business. Um, so just another way of how we can combine these shipping insights with Dun & Bradstreet um, analytic um, products to try and see 
um, how a supply chain can be affected and, and the risks um, that, that there are as well. No, that's, that's good. I appreciate it. Yeah, I think the other thing we talked about uh, as we led up to this was this, this concept of, you know, you, again, buy from, uh, you know, this one company. And if we use kind of the plastic supplier and say, okay, look, I'm buying a, a good from this product or uh, from this company, we, we also don't necessarily understand the health of maybe their parent company because there's maybe they have uh, multiple businesses that are, are all owned by the same parent company. And we're able to kind of get a picture. Can we talk about, and, you know, Sam or, or Matt, you know, you know, let's talk about being able to see those different pieces, but really creating a holistic picture of that whole uh, corporate structure from, from that dis disparate data that of each individual company. So I might be looking at one company thinking, hey, everything's good. But when I look at it in totality, maybe it tells me a different story. Sam? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. Um... Yes, I mean, looking at, um, you know, at one company or, or a subsidiary uh, can give me, you know, some kind of an insight. Um, but also looking at the ultimate parents can give me, you know, a totally different, a totally different picture. But, but also looking from a supply chain perspective, you know, the, I mean, the supply chain is, you know, has like an upstream and downstream. But also when you look upstream, you have multi tiers, right? Um, you know, going to tier one, tier two, tier three, I mean, you know, like most practitioners go to tier one, maybe tier two if they are managing the raw material, uh, but actually going to tier three and tier four can actually provide an insight of, you know, a whole impact of, of these tiers. And then, you know, looking at these multiple tiers, you know, we may find a connection between, you know, an ultimate parent company that has multiple supply chain, you know, nodes within, you know, my supply chain. So, so, you know, looking at the health of a subsidiary versus looking at the ultimate parent will definitely something that, you know, was done in Bradstreet data, it can be done and can provide this, um, you know, visibility for ultimate supply chain um, health and disruption prevention. Anything else to add to that, Matt? Yeah, one, one thing that um, comes to mind when we do talk about, um, you know, the, the corporate family tree and when we're looking at um, branches and subsidiaries and parents um, is that it could be uh, positive too if you're looking at a company that owns a bunch of different manufacturing facilities. Um, if one manufacturing facility um, is being affected by To, let's say another manufacturing facility that's in a different part of the country that isn't being affected. Um, so also understanding that, and then if you're that toy manufacturer um, in you know Tennessee, as we're saying, maybe there's another plastic manufacturer in the Houston area that you can now turn to that wasn't affected. So gaining those insights from um, this corporate family tree structure, I think. Is, is also very valuable. Okay. Uh, so we're almost at time, gentlemen. So uh, I'd like to come to you uh, both with some closing thoughts. Sam, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like, you know, looking at uh, the supply chain is definitely uh, a priority for everyone right now, uh, public and private, uh, because it kind of, you know, provide uh, the methods uh, and, and the mechanisms to alleviate any disruption that can have, you know, on, on, on my company, if, if, it, if I'm a private company or on my region, if I'm, you know, managing this region from, from a public uh, perspective. And, and, you know, like we really didn't talk about like, you know, how detailed uh, we have in, in the, the shipping data. I mean, within the shipping data, we have about for every container, we have 67 events. Uh, that this container goes through. So, you know, having, having these detailed information, uh, we can really go very detailed and we can actually aggregate that up to and, and add it to whatever other data uh, that, that we have or, or, or of interest to be able to provide, you know, macro, uh, macro level, but, you know, the capability to go back to the details to solve the actual problem um, is definitely, you know, something that is everybody is interested in, and it is really a problem solver from my experience. Great, Matt? 
Yeah, I, I would um, second everything Sam said. I, I mean, the usually the supply chain is kind of a mysterious thing. And I think, you know, we, we really don't know too much about um, the supply chain of certain companies or certain industries. And I think the shipping data really allows us to gain a better holistic view of a supply chain network. And when we have this more holistic view, we can then analyze it, find risks, um, find single points of failure. We can take mitigating steps so that when a disruption does happen, we're prepared for it, we're ready for it, and we can take the proper steps. That's great. All right, well, with that, uh, gentlemen, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, let me just look at one thing. Uh, okay, so real quick, we have one question I just want to get answered here. So, uh, so Patricia's asking, she's in the finance office of a local government, and we are a bedroom community to Chicago, and our town's local economy is overwhelmingly medical, hospitals, doctors, offices, et cetera. How can she use this type of information for economic development and redevelopment purposes? And I think, you know, so I'll, I'll kind of start with this. I think part of it is, is looking, you can look at the different communities uh, or the, the businesses that are within this community and then start to roll that down and say, you know, look at, are you seeing an increase or decrease in shipments? Are they buying more? Because if they're importing more, potentially they're manufacturing less. And that might be a sign for, hey, let's go look at this. But if you see that they're outbound shipments and you're, you're looking at the increase in uh, improvement there, uh, potentially that starts to show things like, hey, they are growing. Maybe they need more help uh, and, and they want to start attracting workers. How can I go help them do that? Uh, any, any other kinds of, I think that, that's, a, you know, that's a good place to start. Any other thoughts that might be good uh, things where Patricia could look? Yeah, I think um, in this, as, as Sam was, was saying, in our shipping data, we are able to see the products. Um, and so we, the shipping data would allow you to see um, where medical uh, products, diagnostic equipment, um, equipment found in hospitals, where these um, products are being shipped to, so with, which ports in the United States, which countries are these being shipped from, so that when um, events do happen in the world, you have a better holistic sense of what, what's going to affect you in, in, in Chicago. Okay. Sam, anything yeah, else? I say, yeah, I second that. And, and then, you know, looking at this, you know, like the, the, the product flow over time will definitely show you, you know, if the demand increased or decreased, and that can be a starting point to really identify uh, what is going in the region economically um, and maybe correlate that with other economic indicators that you are looking at it within the financial office to kind of, and this is, this is I think this is a very good question and this is the power here. How can we link the, the indices or the metrics that you are looking at with the supply chain for the ultimate benefit uh, of, your, of your decision making or managing this area? Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks everybody again for the time. Uh, we are at the top of the hour and, uh, you know, Sam and Matt, thank you very much for your time and your expertise. This is a, as we talk about why containers chain of custody matters, and we'll talk through watching the, the containers go through their chain of custody. So you're able to see who's actually touching them, what ports and, and terminals they go through as they make their way from manufacturer to uh, port to your front door. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great week. Thanks. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.